get Glenn out of there. You gotta get somebody in there that the players respect. He doesn't make adjustments. That's just from being in the locker room with him for that one season. He depends more on the players to make those adjustments. But that coach also, you have to come in there and make adjustments as well, especially if what you're trying hasn't worked. And when we were in Boston, as far as the players out there on the floor, we were the one that made the adjustment. All right, come out the huddle. Right before we get on the floor, we huddle up. Hey, man. <laughs> I finally get why your wife almost left you, man. You don't know how to make in-game adjustments. <laughs> you don't know how to make in-game adjustments. When the NBA released their top 15 coaches of all time, Doc Rivers was one of the guys on the list. But if you've seen how the media or the fans or even former players who played under him talk about him, you would think he was one of the worst coaches in the NBA. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. But you can't ignore the vast amount of slander towards Doc, and you can't ignore his lack of playoff success. He's been resting on his laurels from that 2008 championship. And even with that stacked Celtics roster, his team didn't win a single road game in the playoffs until the Eastern Conference Finals. They got pushed to seven games in the first two rounds by teams that were clearly inferior to them. So was that even an impressive run to begin with? Anyway, how's going folks? My name's Andy, and today we're gonna take a look at something different. Let's take a detailed dive into Doc Rivers' coaching career his shortcomings, and what his former players have said about him, and if his negative perception is justified. Without further ado, let's begin. In 1999, a few years after his retirement, Glenn Anton Rivers became head coach of a young Orlando Magic team. This team just started rebuilding in the post-Penny Hardaway era, and as a first-year head coach, Rivers shocked everybody. This Magic team was projected to win fewer than 20 games, yet he led them to a respectable 41-41 and -41 record, and almost made the playoffs. This earned him the 2000 Coach of the Year award, becoming one of a small handful of coaches to win it in their first ever season as head coach. Due to his connections across the NBA and as a recently retired player, he had a level of influence that most coaches could only dream of. In that same summer he won Coach of the Year, he had the ambitions to create a Big Three. And he was talking to a few star players in the offseason. The Big Three he had in mind was supposed to consist of Tracy McGrady, Grant Hill, and Tim Duncan, all of whom were free agents. While the Magic did sign T-Mac and Hill, Duncan almost came to Orlando too. Grant Hill confirmed that Doc met with Tim Duncan and he was on the brink of convincing him to come to Orlando. But then, something happened. This was the story according to Hill. Quote, I was there, I made my visit with Tim Duncan. I was at the dinner when someone in Tim's entourage who asked Doc, can significant others travel on the plane? And Doc said no. And afterward, my wife said, he should have just lied, he should have said yes. Bruce Bowen confirmed this story. When Tim went out to meet with Orlando, he asked this question, can family come on the flights to some games? And from what I understand, Doc said no, and that's where he lost Tim Duncan. Despite being a new head coach, Doc had plenty of relationships to tap into. And even though he made this blunder and lost Tim Duncan, he still got T-Mac and Hill. Unfortunately, Hill suffered quite a lot of injuries in Orlando. But T-Mac developed into a superstar, one of the NBA's best players. Let's fast forward a bit. While they had some decent seasons together, the team struggled to get past the first round. In the 2003 playoffs, the Magic, as an 8th seed, had a 3-1 series lead over the Detroit Pistons. A lead that they would ultimately blow, as it would be the first of three times a Doc Rivers coached team has blew a 3-1 lead. At this point, he was still perceived as a great coach though. Just to go up 3-1 against the 1 seed is an accomplishment in itself. Honestly, it was more so because T-Mac was just going off. The strategy of the early 2000s was to basically throw the ball to your superstar and let him ISO, and it wasn't a bad plan back then. It's not like he had much help either. However, in the following season, the Magic started with a 1-10 record, and Doc got fired. Now, one thing that's surprising about Doc's coaching career is that he hasn't had any breaks at all. Whenever he gets fired or he resigns, he almost immediately gets a new job in the season after. In 24 straight seasons, from 2000 to 2023, 
he's coached in every single season with no breaks. I mean, no matter how you look at that, it's very impressive. Just the longevity and the continuity, you know, that's very rare. In spite of Doc's track record, he's got the connections and even though some players dislike him and all his faults as a coach, other coaches and his peers respect him. You know, it's kind of like the guy at every workplace who, you know he might not have all the skills, but he's charismatic. He gets along with his bosses, so he might get a promotion before someone who's better at their job does. Is that a good example? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, ever since he started his coaching career, he's had this aura about him that makes people want to get along with him, that makes people gravitate towards him. And I don't blame him either. You gotta take every advantage you can get, and he knows to talk to the right people. One positive thing that former players have said is that Doc is a player's coach. So what does that mean? It means he has your back and will support you in not just basketball, but in life as well. That's a quality that's hard to find in a coach. Even though, well, we have seen him throw some players under the bus. So the season after he got fired in Orlando, Doc made his way to Boston. With Paul Pierce as the franchise player, it still took a few losing seasons until 2007, when they formed their big three and they finally became relevant again. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this Celtics squad won 66 games and was far and away the best team in the NBA. So to see them struggle so much in the first couple rounds in the playoffs, that's strictly a coaching issue. Or in this case, a lack of coaching. I think he did some really, really crazy things. You know what I mean? I love Spencer Halls. Like, you know, he just, just did a lot of things. He, you know, and then now when you lose, you know, the communication with your head coach, and now there's questions and things with your players. Now your players not seeing eye to eye. You're not getting your players on one accord, you know, because now our leader is miscommunications with, you know, getting the message out from the coach. Mm -hmm. So now there's just so much misdirection. And I think our coach, you know, could have did a little bit more to get us together. I just kind of felt like there was always friction, whether spoken, unspoken, amongst our stars. Yeah, always, always, always. And he didn't step in. According to former Celtic Glenn Davis, who was part of that championship team, this is what he said in regards to that title. Quote, What Doc had in 08 was special, and he was lucky as hell, lucky as hell. The year before that, they were wearing trash bags in the crowd. But then the next year they win it and now he's one of the best coaches ever? I'm just not feeling that, you know what I mean? You give credit to KG, you give credit to Paul Pierce, you give credit to Ray Allen. Those are the guys that made sure whatever Doc needed to be done, got done. Over the years, Glenn Davis has probably been the biggest critic of Doc, even when he played for him again on the Clippers, when Doc was the team president. It was a trend that whenever he made a bad trade or a bad signing, he would not own up to it. He would not take responsibility. Instead, he would keep trying to force the guy to play to validate his decision. This is what Davis said. Quote, you go get Spencer Hawes, he does nothing. You've got to trade him. You've still got me on the bench knowing that I can play, but you still go play Spencer Hawes knowing that you're just trying to cover your own butt, because Spencer's not panning out the way you wanted him to pan out. And I just don't like that. I'm not feeling that. That's what I want to talk about next, his time with the Clippers. It was funny how he got there to begin with. The Clippers traded a first round pick to Boston to acquire Doc. Only a handful of times in NBA history has a coach gotten traded. But when the Clippers made this deal, Doc wanted full control of the organization. Not only was he the coach, but he was also the senior VP of basketball operations. So he had a say in every single transaction they'd make. Joining a team that had high expectations with a deep roster and a ton of talent, in seven years coaching the Clippers, they did not make it past the second round in any season. And in two of those seasons, they blew a 3-1 lead in the semifinals. Injuries played a substantial role as well, but even when healthy in the series that they were leading or in the series they were expected to win, they still could not get it done. It was around this time when people started to realize Doc is not a good coach, and his lack of in-game adjustments in the playoffs was quite evident. Sometimes when the opponents go on a run, he doesn't even call a timeout and expects his players to figure it out, which both Jamal Crawford and JJ Redick alluded to. Even recently, Doc was interviewed and stated, Then the Clippers, and not trying to take anything away from that team, not 
that team was never going to win when you look back at it. Uh, we just didn't get along well enough as a group. And you can't win without cooperation. That's the only way you can win. Reddick and Crawford both had issues with that comment. As JJ responded, I was going to say, well, damn. I felt like, what, what can we say that if our coach believes we're never going to win? Like, that was kind of, and maybe he'll get more into it. How'd you take it? That we, we still could have had something special. And then to not get any of that, like, accountability from him. And the interesting part, too, is he's talking about players getting along. And, like, he was brought in, I thought, at least after, after, um, after Vinny left, like, Doc's reputation, right, was, like, as a personality manager. And he was the GM. So, like, if, if people weren't getting along, like, it's, I don't know, it's kind of on you. JJ nailed it on the head. It's the accountability that we rarely ever get from Doc. He puts the blame on everyone else but him. Even with that incredibly talented Clippers team, who was poised to win the NBA championship that year, they blew a 3-1 lead in another series they were favored to win, and then Doc left. However, that doesn't stop him from getting hired over and over again. On September 28th, 2020, he stepped down as the Clippers head coach. Just five days later on October 3rd, the Philadelphia 76ers announced they hired him as their new head coach. There were rumors prior to that of Doc talking to other teams when he was still coaching the Clippers, which is taboo in the coaching world. You're not supposed to do that. And almost immediately, this hiring was met with groans from the Sixers fandom. For a while though, things started to look up. That's the thing with Doc, he typically has a great first season as a coach, which is why he stays around for a few years, but it doesn't get better from there. In the 2020-21 season, the Sixers finished with the best record in the Eastern Conference. This was their year. But we all know how it ended. While most people blamed Embiid's poor performances and Simmons' lack of aggression for their loss, Doc isn't devoid of blame as well. When you lose despite being heavily favored to win, <laughs> again, you got outcoached. And it's funny because Nate McMillan had one of the worst track records in the playoffs. Since he started coaching in 2001, McMillan never brought any of his teams to the conference finals, until he faced Doc and the Sixers. That was a common trend in his entire time in Philly. By the time the playoffs start, Embiid has always underperformed and that's on him. But Doc hasn't helped to try and get him easier looks either. It's just constant force feeding him the ball in the post over and over again, just to watch him struggle against an elite defender. He doesn't draw up a play to get Embiid an easy bucket, or run some off screens to get him an open shot, or just something to get him in rhythm. Compare that to Mike Malone with Jokic. When Jokic or when any of his players are struggling, he always tries to draw up a play for them, to get them into rhythm. These are just small things you can do to help support your star. With Doc, there was nothing. The same plays over and over again down the stretch, and it did not work. Not only that, but even when the Celtics went on a massive run, he let them do it, and didn't even call a timeout until it was too late. I won't put all the blame on Doc in Philly. There are serious cultural issues that need to be addressed. There are games when the Sixers are still in the game, but they've already given up. Every time their players miss a couple shots, they get deflated, and their entire body language suffers. Like JJ said before, Doc is known as someone who can establish a positive culture in the locker room. That's why he was brought to Philly in the first place, to change the atmosphere and build a camaraderie between the players. But if he wasn't able to do that in Philly, what does he provide? After that Game 7 loss, Doc fell to just 6-10 and 10 all time in Game 7s, and he lost his last 5 Game 7s. In fact, it's been over a decade since Doc made it past the second round. The last time he did was in 2012 with the Boston Celtics. I also saw this post on Reddit that said Doc lost his last 10 games when he has a chance to advance his team to the conference finals, going back to 2015. There's honestly never been another coach that's had this bad of a track record. This much negativity of how so many of his former players talk about him. And yet, whenever he leaves a team, he immediately gets a new offer. His 2008 title has been milked into oblivion. If it wasn't for that championship, he would never get this many chances. As for his relationship with Joel Embiid, it was always very good. And Embiid himself has stated he's shocked and sad that Doc got fired. 
That doesn't matter though, cause we've seen superstars say this before. Giannis was so upset Kidd got fired, but then won a championship with their new coach. Steph Curry was really sad over the firing of Mark Jackson, but then won a championship a year later with Steve Kerr. Hell, even Michael Jordan was pissed off when Doug Collins got fired, but Phil Jackson turned them into a championship team. So to have your superstar be upset at a coach's firing, maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, that's all folks. Let me know your thoughts on Doc Rivers. Let me know in the comment section. Thank you all so much for watching, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.